very, very different world. I struggle with the whole concept um, from the standpoint that, you know, I've been here 25 years, and um, I really believe I'm a different manager today than I was 25 years ago. I mean, I've had a lot of experience. Um, I've learned from that experience. I manage differently today. The whole organizational development process we've been going through, I've been able to do a lot of soul-searching in terms of my own performance and how I might change and how I might prove. Now, granted, when I leave, there could be a totally different personality within this office, but my point is that the existing management team can and will change to, be, to, to a better job um, uh, running this organization and to a better job responding to the environment that we're in. So I don't know. I think the next person is just going to continue the march. I think the march has already begun. Maybe the next person might march a little faster or a little bit differently. I, I, I reject, for example, when people tell me, well, you know, we've got to change the culture around here. And I always say, well, what part of the culture don't you like? Um, because there's part of me that says, you know, we do have a culture. If, if you define culture kind of the way we do things around here, some of the way we do things around here is quite nice. <laughs> some of the th way we do things around here need to be changed. But I don't really think that what's going to happen to this organization is turning it upside down. I think what needs to happen to this organization is the continued development, you know, in our people to continually get better results. And I think we're doing that. And I think we've got people on board. I mean, I got to tell you, when I took over from the guy I replaced, totally different personalities, and I think mine works better for today than perhaps his would have. But from a business standpoint, from a strategic standpoint, we were very similar. Uh, all I know is that I have an obligation to grow the people below me, and I have a very strong obligation personally. This has never been put to me by the board, but I have a personal obligation and belief that hiring from within is the best model. Thank you very, very much for being so open, so so honest and candid. And it's very, I think, rare for the president and CEO of an organization to be able to do that, and I, we appreciate that. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Okay, thanks very much. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye. I really just have to say how, how rare that is and that how open and candid it is for, for Peter to be that way. It is for him to talk so openly about the early stages of such an important project and to share his personal thoughts and concerns, particularly on this very delicate and sensitive matter that's going to have enormous consequences for his future, for the future of his organization. Uh, I was particularly impressed by how Peter shared not just his professional opinions, but his evolving approach to looking at himself and all of the talent in his organization right now in a way that's different from how he was ever doing it before. What I'd like to do now is toss out another question to our audience, if I may. I'm curious to see, where would you look for the next leader of your organization? Outside the organization? Someone with a fresh vision who can take the company to a whole different level? Or within the company? Someone who's already familiar with how the organization operates? If you could weigh in now. Interesting, interesting. It looks like it's breaking out to about one-third looking outside the organization and two-thirds looking within. Uh, what is your take on those results, Joe? Um, well, Patrick, I, I can talk about numerous studies that support the greater success levels of internal promotions. Senior executives fail in general 34% of the time when hired from the outside and 24% when hired from the inside. Also, organizations that rely on external candidates to fill middle management positions have almost double the turnover rate of organizations who rely on internal promotions. So, you know, this really points to the fact that it's a little less risky to promote from within. And Peter certainly uh, was consistent with that. For him, it seemed it was very important to find a successor within the organization. But that's not always easy, given the current competition among companies today to hire top talent, is it? No, that's right. Potential leaders will have greater choices as to where they want to work, and they're likely to be able to use multiple offers to negotiate. 
There's already a war for talent going on, and it's only going to get more intense over the next five years. That really sets the stage for why succession planning is so important. Uh, before we move on, Joe, could you give us a model uh, or more of a detailed definition of what succession planning is? Sure, Patrick. Succession planning is a process to ensure leadership and organizational continuity. It includes identifying high potential candidates for accelerated development, recommending development actions for this pool of high potentials, and then filling open leadership positions. So, uh, and as we said before, those members of the baby boomer generation are getting closer and closer to the retirement age, and that just keeps increasing. So having a succession plan in place is definitely crucial now, maybe even more than ever before? Absolutely. Every time I have a conversation with a CEO, he or she is concerned about their leadership team. I'd like to share a quote from a highly successful CEO about this very issue. He says, the thing that keeps me up in the middle of the night is not what might happen to the economy or what our competitors might do next. It's worrying about whether we have the leadership capacity and talent to implement new and more complex competitive strategies. That's really what it comes down to. That's an excellent quote. I can't help but think that there are so many organizations in similar situations to Central Names, you know, where Peter Chalk, for example, has been in a leadership position for over two decades, and he and his executive team are all the ones with the knowledge, the skills, and the experience to direct the organization. And when they leave, how do you find the right people to pick up where they left off? Well, that's a good question because institutional knowledge will also head out the door with those people retiring. So keeping your leaders is essential to business continuity, for one thing, and ensuring that future leaders' growth needs are being met is a necessity for retaining um, and developing top talent. Well, well, take us through, if you would, uh, then, Joe, the first steps in the succession planning process. Um, okay. You can see here on this slide that there are five questions I encourage companies to ask themselves before getting started. First, do we have people who are ready now if we have vacancies and key positions that can ensure the continuity and growth of our company? Next, what does it cost to fill a leadership vacancy with someone from the outside? Actually, the average cost is about two and a half times the salary, and that's pretty significant. Do we risk compromising leadership qualities just to fill openings? Well, I would say yes, because when a key position is open, organizations are usually pretty urgent about filling them because of the chaos that can result from leaving a critical position unfilled. So many times there are compromises due to that urgent need to fill the position. Next, have the business challenges faced by our top leaders changed significantly over the past five to ten years? We see that the challenges now are much more complex than ever before, and leaders at all levels are asked to play multiple roles, including strategist, coach, global thinker, change driver, and entrepreneur. How many of our current executives say they were, they were well prepared for their first leadership role? And finally, what percentage of our leaders would be selected if they were applying for their current position today? I have asked these questions of many leadership teams and most executives say that they weren't fully prepared for their first leadership role and that they probably wouldn't have qualified for their current position as it's evolved today. That really helps to frame it out very nicely. Uh, that's a great list, Joe. Um, after you go through that list and determine what you need in your succession plan, what's next? Well, once you've determined that your organization is ready for succession planning, you need to identify the traits of top leaders for your organization. My experience has led me to believe that much of leadership talent is hardwired in people before they reach their early or mid-20s. Unfortunately, most companies um, don't focus on accurately identifying leadership potential when someone is first hired. Well, how does an organization identify who has the potential for success as a leader? Well, below the surface of, of observable behaviors, attitudes, and actions, lies the fundamental personality traits and core motivations that drive them. If you can identify those personality traits, you can identify potential leaders at any level of the organization. And you should actively identify high potential individuals rather than assuming that the best leaders will bubble up and gain the skills and experiences needed to lead in the future. 
You should also cast a wide net when looking for potential leaders so as not to miss good people wherever they are. What we're looking at now is, is a graph of the traits that corporate leaders have in common. Joe, could you do us a favor and take us through and tell us what these traits, uh, about these traits and how they're consistent among leaders, uh, which distinguishing qualities leaders share in common? Sure. You can see when you look at the graph on the page, it's broken down into four competency areas that are listed on the left side. The blue bars indicate the range of scores from top leaders in our database. Under leadership, we see a highly assertive person who's able to communicate clearly and directly, gaining commitment for his or her ideas. They're also able to take calculated risks and bounce back quickly from setbacks when they occur. Um, interpersonally, leaders tend to be comfortable with people, understanding the subtle clues and cues given by others, and they usually have a, have a healthy skepticism that often comes with experience. In the problem-solving decision-making area, leaders are able to creatively solve complex problems, taking risks when necessary, and they have a strong sense of urgency about making decisions. And last, under the personal organization and time management group, leaders are able to juggle multiple tasks at one time and move through tasks quickly. They're typically not very detail-oriented or extremely thorough. That, that doesn't surprise me. Um, what we've discussed here, you, you just shared with us the qualities, the traits that are needed uh, to be a successful leader. Uh, what have you found in your surveys uh, of leaders that are the most important and the most difficult aspects of being a leader? Yes, well, we've learned that leaders believe the most important aspects of strong leadership involve the ability to create a vision, analyze situations, and develop strategies, instill enthusiasm and momentum in all employees, surround themselves with the right people. They understand that collaboration is key to the best solutions. Take risks when needed. You don't often know every detail before making a decision. And develop other leaders. And I think that's the most important, of the, important job of any leader of people. That is, and to be able to be open and honest about that, as Peter was doing, and to come back and, and to find someone who will be able to, to take the organization to the next level. That gives us a, a, an idea, Joe, of what makes an effective leader. But uh, are there also traits to look out for that will help us determine who would not be successful as a leader? Yes. We've listed a few here. You can read them on the slide. The interesting thing is that most often leadership derailers are what cause the demise of leaders. It's not the failure of projects or poor performance on the metrics or standards set forth in the job. It's really these leadership derailers. How does a company determine what the right plan is for them, Joe? Well, let's start with simplicity. I think the less bureaucratic and complicated the program, the more likely it will be implemented, followed, and be effective. You also need support of top management. They, they must be fully behind the program, and we've seen programs fail without this. The monitoring, key stakeholders, including participants in the program, mentors and supervisors, should be encouraged to suggest improvements, changes, and enhancements to the program. More critically, such change should be embraced and implemented if it makes sense. A succession management program needs to be innately flexible to respond to changes in strategy, market changes, and growth. Next, focus. A good succession management program doesn't just seek to line up replacements for key roles, but it seeks to foster growth for future leaders. If people don't feel their development and learning is appreciated by the company, they're likely to seek other opportunities. Also, the developmental activities should be diverse incorporating coaching, mentoring, job rotations, internal and external training programs, and formal feedback programs. And last, the process should be business-driven. The purpose of the succession management program is to ensure your business's continual growth and improvement. Therefore, linking the program to current and future needs and goals is essential. Future leaders should be involved in helping to shape the business as part of their learning. Action learning programs, for instance, are the principal method of connecting succession management with business goals. 